My name's Angelo and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC 297 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and draft Kings plays. But before I do, let's look at the wild success that our premium members have been having playing DraftKings Fantasy. We have over $415,000 in winning tickets from our premium members over the last four to five months. These are astonishing numbers. Nobody else in this industry has a community putting up numbers like this. Most recently, a couple thousand bucks at UFC Vegas 84. That ticket's right down here from Dead Plumber. Congratulations to him and the rest of the premium member communities that continue to go out there and dominate these UFC pay-per-view cards. The reason our premium members are having so much success is our DraftKings offering is some of the best in the business. Not only are we going to give you the best ownership projections in the game, we're also going to give you our insight as to who should be in your lineups, who you should avoid putting in your lineups, and we're also going to give you a DraftKings optimizer. This will literally build your lineups for you. This will build one lineup, this will build 150 lineups, and it'll be pre-populated every single Friday before every single fight card with the ownership projections and the scoring projections. And as I mentioned, these are some of the best projections in the game. Quite literally, every single week we are number one or number two with the margin of error from the projections to the actuals. And whoever is the other person, like let's say we're number one and there's a number two or we're number two, number one, the other person, it's not an awesome it's not a roto grinders, it alternates every single week. We have the most consistent and the most accurate ownership projections in the game. Join this community that has been dominating for only $10 for an entire month. If you want to go to an awesome or roto grinders, they're going to charge you $100 a month per sport. We're $10 and we've given you everything. We want picks.com, click become a member at the top. Let's go ahead and break down this card. The weigh-ins are not over. We have already had a couple of flubs, though. Malcolm Gordon missed by one and a half pounds. Malcolm Gordon, who is somehow a two-to-one favorite, missed by one and a half pounds. Anybody betting on Malcolm Gordon needs to really take a look at their life and understand why the hell would you do that? Why would you do that? On this card, he might win and the bet will hit, but like, let's not pretend that's a good bet. Let's go ahead and break down this card. Opening up the UFC 297 fight card, we have Malcolm Gordon and Jimmy Flick. That's actually quite the fight to open the card with. But Malcolm Gordon is the Canadian on this card. And I have seen a lot of narratives in my comment section. Hey, at the last UFC Canada, every single Canadian won. Was Malcolm Gordon on the last UFC Canada? This guy's not winning this fight. And I don't mean to say that that confidently because... He might actually win this fight. But we do have grappler versus grappler here. Malcolm Gordon is a grappler. He's very chinny. He's got some decent striking, and he is tough, but he is a grappler. He's got a BJJ black belt. His takedown defense is an abysmal 9%. His takedown offense is only 30%. But when he can get it to the ground, he can have some success. You're going to see this Dennis Bondar, KO, TKO. That was a freak arm injury. He did not win that fight. And you're going to see the win over Figueredo. This was the other Figueredo, not the good one. But he did win this fight. He had some takedowns, some good control. Figgy's defense didn't matter. and uh, Or uh, offensive jiu-jitsu didn't matter. And Malcolm Gordon was able to win that fight. But since then, freak injury with Dennis Bondar. Super fast. Muhammad Makayev, that was actually a competitive back and forth fight. But it seems like every Makayev fight is competitive before the finish. And then Jake Hadley knocked his head off. Malcolm Gordon has somehow become a minus 180 favorite. I don't know how that has happened and again, he may win this fight because he's fighting Jimmy Flick. I think what the UFC did was said, hey, Malcolm's a Canadian. We have him on the UFC Canada card. We want to get this guy a win. Who on our roster can this guy beat? And they're like, eh, maybe Jimmy Flick. Jimmy Flick is also a grappler, but he's a much more aggressive grappler than Malcolm Gordon. This win over Cody Durden was incredible. It was an incredible, go find the highlight on YouTube. That was an incredible submission win. And he is a very good grappler. He built himself a nice career, came into the UFC, opened up with a splash. And then you can see a three-year layoff. He like retired, had issues with his dad. I, it was weird. Came back, got knocked out by Charles Johnson, which is kind of embarrassing because Charles Johnson has no power. Then he lost to Alessandro Costa. That's not that bad. Alessandro Costa is very good, good power, good striker. That, you know, that is what it is. But people are somehow seeing this. Ah, oh, this guy's coming off two knockouts in a row. So is Malcolm Gordon coming off two finish losses in a row. Oh, but he was just knocked out in a minute. So was Malcolm Gordon. 
These guys are identical. This fight should be a 50-50 fight. There should not be a two-to-one favorite in this fight. Jimmy Flick, I do think he wins because he's the better grappler, and this is grappler versus grappler. If Malcolm Gordon strikes only, doesn't mess with the wrestling, doesn't mess with the grappling, and only strikes, he, he beats Jimmy Flick for sure, for sure. But we've never seen Malcolm Gordon only strike. We've always seen him try to grapple. We know Jimmy's going to try to grapple. This will be a grappling match. I think Jimmy's the better grappler. I do wish I would get better pricing on him. I wish the DraftKings pricing reflected the betting odds because Jimmy Flick's a plus 185 underdog. So he should be like $7,200, not 79. I don't love the cost. I don't love the price. This is going to be a weird fight. It's either going to be three rounds of sloppy nonsense or one of these guys is going to get a finish and put some real points on the board. I do think the winner of this fight probably scores pretty well. I think that's going to be Jimmy Flick. I wish I would get better pricing on him in this matchup. Then we have Jasmine Jazza Divicious. I mentioned the weigh-ins are not over, but this fight was moved. This was supposed to be at 125. They moved it to 135, and Jasmine's camp released a statement saying that's because Priscilla Cachera a few days ago said, hey, I'm not going to make the weight. Can we do this at 35? And of course, they obliged. So we got Priscilla Cachera, who's kind of fat, didn't prepare, I guess, taking on Jasmine Jazz Divisions. I love Jasmine. She's my most confident fighter on this card. The issue is, if we look at $9,500 and we look at what she has scored, she doesn't score that well. Even if you wanted to give her the Tracy Cortez win, which was a very close fight, that's 80 points. Miranda Maverick, okay, 85. That doesn't cover that 9,500 salary. She only covered it one single time against Fernandez, and that's because she went all in on the wrestling. Four takedowns, 12 and a half minutes of control time. That was coming off that Karini Silva loss, so she was like, I need to get this back wrestled heavy. It's going to be interesting because she is fighting Priscilla Cachera, and if she comes in with this same game plan that she did against Fernandez, who's a nasty kickboxer, then she's going to be worth the $9,500. But not knowing what her game plan is going to be, it's a little bit risky to spend this money. I am insanely confident in her. But she is fighting Priscilla Cachera. Priscilla Cachera, one of the more dangerous women in this division. And you can see her record, record, record is riddled with knockout wins. She has very real power. This Gina Mazzani win is the one and only win that concerns me. Because all of these other ones... These women aren't great, couldn't really take her down, and then she blasted them. We know Jasmine's a very good wrestler. She will be able to take Priscilla down. But Gina Mazzani did get Priscilla down, did win that first round, and then in the second round got blasted. That does concern me, but doesn't concern me enough to throw her in my lineup. I am very confident in Jasmine Jazza Devicious. She's my most confident play on this entire card. $9,500 is a lot of money to spend unless she's going to go all in on the wrestling so I'll let you guys decide what you want to do with that. Does Priscilla asking for 10 more pounds matter? Is she unprepared? Is she exhausted? Is Jasmine going to be able to get her down and submit her? I don't know. Jasmine's not exactly a submission machine, but she is a nonstop wrestler. Problem is she's also a pretty good striker. And when she has success striking, she just sticks with that. So she may come out here, have a success with her jab, have some decent striking, and just stick with the striking, not wrestle, and then she will never be worth the $9,500. But let's hope she recognizes how dangerous Priscilla is. Let's hope she goes all in on the wrestling like she did when she fought Fernandez, who was also a dangerous striker. But Jasmine's going to win this fight. Very, very confident in her. And then we have Johan Lioness taking on Sam Patterson. $8,400, Johan, probably a great price. Probably a great price, $8,400. This guy is a grappler, but he has insane knockout power. He's got very real power in his hands. But as I mentioned, he's a grappler. The only thing that concerns me, look at this. He won this fight against Darian Weeks, 40 points. 30 of those points are the win bonus. 40 points. I mean, ouch. Ouch. Imagine... You spend $8,000 on this guy and he put up 40 points in a win? That's tough. Anyway, Johan Lioness is a grappler. He's got insane, very real power in his hands. He wings big, heavy punches. He charges forward. And then when you think you're in a striking match, he lowers his level, shoots a takedown, gets it to the ground, likes to grapple. He's taking on Sam Patterson. The reason Johan's a little bit of a favorite here, even though his record is not great and his skill set is just okay, the reason he's a big favorite here is he's fighting Sam Patterson. Sam Patterson was just knocked out cold by a very short Yanal Auschmaus. 
Sam Patterson's a long, lanky striker. He has insane length. He's six foot four in this division, which is kind of wild. Striking wise, he doesn't really use the length. It's like he's long, so he'll pump a jab, but he doesn't stay out of danger. The very short Yanal Asmon's got right inside, blasted him in the face and put him down. Sam Patterson is hittable. We said that when we broke it down against Yanal Asmon's. We actually picked Yanal to win because he was so hittable. Because he's hittable, I think Johan Linus can get to him, can find the chin, can knock him out. $8,400 in DraftKings, you're really going to be all in on Yanal by knockout. Because I don't think he's going to outgrapple Sam Patterson. Even if he was to take Tam... Did I have a stroke? Even if he is able to take Sam down, that wild length that he doesn't use well on his feet, he does use it well on the ground. He's constantly wrapping something up, constantly reaching over, tying you down, and working something in. So Sam Patterson, very good on the ground with that length. And Johan Lioness might have some trouble if he shoots takedowns, but I think Johan wins $8,400 is a very, very tempting price point. Then we have Jillian Robertson taking on Pollyanna Viana. Jillian Robertson owns the record for most submission wins in this division. And you can see sub, 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 sub. I mean, tons of submission wins, literally the record for most in this division. I mean, just look at this. Look how insanely dangerous she is. Although this was a submission loss to Buena Silva, who we'll break down later. But Jillian Robertson, if she can get the takedown, if she can dictate the grappling, she wins this fight in almost every other one. Her offensive grappling is spectacular. Her defensive grappling, however, there's not much there. And when I say defensive grappling, I mean, I shouldn't say defensive grappling. Grappling off of her back, she is not nearly as good as when she's on top. And we saw that in the Tabitha Ricci fight. Tabitha Ricci took her down, no problem. All the control, beat her up. Like no, Tabitha Ricci at no point was in any danger, had no issues whatsoever. So if you're able to come forward and you're able to take Jillian down, you can hang on on top. She's not going to submit you off her back. Especially not Pollyanna Viana because Pollyanna Viana is a jiu-jitsu black belt. She's a very skilled grappler. Yes, she was just submitted by Eisman Lucindo. Eisman's a different beast. I think Eisman blows through Jillian Robertson as well. Pollyanna Viana, you're going to see the knockout Jin Yu Fry. And yes, all of a sudden she had power in her hands, but Jin Yu's a little older, uh, but that did put her down and put her down bad. But Pollyanna Viana is also a grappler, very, very dangerous herself. You're going to see all these submission wins. She is sort of finish or bust though. She is very finishable, but she's also very, very dangerous. I think Jillian Robertson, I think this is a great fight for her. I think it's tailor-made for her. I think she will get the takedowns. I think she will grind. Maybe this is a decision. Maybe it's a finish. But I think Jillian Robertson is going to get the win. She is probably worth her DraftKings price tag because most of the time when she wins, she wins by submission and puts up numbers. Even if she doesn't win by submission, she is going to be, her striking is abysmal. So she is going to be grappling. We're going to get takedown points. We're going to get control time points. I like Jillian Robertson. I will probably have her in a lineup. And then that takes us to Siri Saidi and Ramon Tavares. This is a rematch. You're not going to see it in here because it happened on the Contender Series. Siri Saidi knocked out his opponent in their last fight. Knocked him out. And people say it was an early stoppage, and I, I would tend to agree with that. But the reality is, he still blasted that dude, put him on his ass, and the referee was in a position to make a decision. So for people to be like, oh, but Ramon, his striking is so good, he was winning in this... Dude, he got blasted, dropped, and the referee had to make a decision. Did he jump the gun a little bit? Was Ramon still sort of had his wits about him? Yeah, he did. It's probably a little bit of an early stoppage, but referee's not that position if you don't get absolutely blasted and dropped. But Siri Saidi is a tall, long striker. He can grapple when he needs to. Very powerful guy. We saw it when he knocked out his opponent last time they fought. Doesn't use his range very well, but most of these fighters don't. We will break down Sean Woodson next, who does. But Siri likes to plot forward, keep that jab in your face, throw big shots when he has that opportunity. His jiu-jitsu is good enough that if he's on the ground, if he's off his back, he can make something happen there as well. He's taking on Ramon Tavares. Ramon Tavares, I think his Instagram handle is catch these hands. And he caught some hands in the last fight with Siri. He caught it right in the face. Anyway, he is a powerful striker, though. He is very good. I'm not trying to undermine his skills because he can strike very, very well. 
And he is powerful. And he can get to you. He does keep his hands low, but those are there to protect himself from takedowns. And then he likes to counter strike. He has incredible power, very fast hands. He does stand southpaw, and he will launch that power left with incredible speed. Does a really good job mixing up the head and the body shots. And he's got a decent get-up game if he is taken down, but we saw this fight already. He lost this fight already, and I think he loses it again. I will say what works against Siri Saidi in this matchup, potentially. I don't know him well enough as a fighter to know where his headspace is, but if he thinks he's just going to come in here, ah, I knocked him out, I'm going to knock him out. Done. I already knocked him out. How hard is it to do that again? That could get him into some trouble because Ramon is very good is very dangerous, and does have real power. So if Siri comes in overly confident, a little too loose, a little too ready to go with the knockout and doesn't keep a tight guard and doesn't fight a technical fight, Ramon could absolutely find that chin, could absolutely put him out. I do think Siri wins. He already won this fight, but let's just hope he is mature enough. Let's just hope he has control and he fights this fight as if they have never fought before and he comes forward, he keeps it tight, he keeps it technical and he finds his spot because Ramon is dangerous, Ramon does hit hard and you should definitely have a few lineups with Ramon in it as well as Siri because somebody's going to win, somebody's going to win by stoppage and somebody's going to put up some solid points here. Then we have Charles Jordan taking on Sean Woodson. Charles Jordan will be the crowd favorite. He will be. 100%. He's an exciting guy. He's the Canadian on a Canadian card. He's a come forward striker. He stays busy, stays in your face. He will spin, flip, jump, do all the things. And that's why people absolutely love him, me included. He is a dog who fights ugly, doesn't quit, and stays in your face. Problem is, he can get taken down. Takedown defense is pretty trash. He can get taken down. But he's had some all-time fights. And even in his losses, look at this, 59 points in the loss. A lot of people think he beat Shane Burgos, but 59 points in a loss, 46 points in a loss, 48 points in a loss. Charles Jourdain puts up numbers, just straight up puts up numbers. Every single one of these is a high scoring fight, even the losses. He puts up DraftKings numbers. For that reason, you probably want to consider him in your lineup, but he is fighting Sean Woodson. Let me highlight this number here. He took down Dennis Bazooka four times. Yes, Dennis Bazooka stepped up on short notice, like a week. But Sean Woodson is a professional boxer who worked his way into MMA. The fact that he came out here and out-wrestled the wrestler was like, what the hell? Nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw that coming. Everybody picked Sean Woodson to win. Nobody thought he would win with some grappling. And frankly, he didn't look very comfortable striking, which was a very bizarre flipperino with the skill set there. But Sean Woodson, very clean boxer. Very long, he uses his range well. His length is, he could scratch his knees standing straight up. His arms are long as hell, and he uses that reach really well. That's where that professional boxing background comes in handy. He's fighting Charles Jordan, and that's what makes this so tricky because now we know Sean Woodson can wrestle. Charles Jordan has no takedown defense whatsoever. If Charles Jordan comes forward too aggressive and Sean Woodson wants to grapple, all of a sudden the professional boxer could win a grappling match here. But Charles Jordan has more ways to win this fight. He's the more experienced fighter. He's the grittier fighter. And, I, you know, I'm not going to say Sean Woodson, we, we don't know how tough he is, honestly. He hasn't been in a straight-up war yet. Julian Arosa was able to submit him, but Julian Arosa is also a dog. Frankly, Julian Arosa fights very similar to Charles Jordan. I got to go Charles Jordan here, but I think Sean Woodson is a good underdog. And again, if you're chasing... Those giant tournaments where they let you enter 100 lineups, 50 lineups, whatever it is, definitely have some exposure to Sean Woodson. If you're using our optimizer, if you're a premium member at wewantpicks.com, you get the optimizer. It's preloaded with all the data. You make a few decisions, and then the optimizer builds lineups based off of the decisions you've made. Definitely tell it to have some exposure to Sean Woodson. I think he's a great underdog. I am picking Charles Jordan to win, but Charles Jordan... Very aggressive, almost too aggressive. Sean Woodson, laser pinpoint accuracy with that striking. Should be a very fun fight. This is great matchmaking. Then we have Garrett Armfield and Brad Katana for the featured prelim. Brad Katana is a very, very good fighter. A very accomplished fighter. He has won the Ultimate Fighter twice. A two-time Ultimate Fighter winner. And that's not an easy thing to do. That is a tournament. There are multiple fights. 
and you work your way through the tournament. And he did that two times and he won it both times. Most recently, he won the ultimate fighter with Conor McGregor this last season, season 31. And he bought, bought, and he fought Cody Gibson to a decision, but he was busy. 173 strikes, 160 of them were significant. No real grappling happened, so he only put up 97 points. But 97 points with just striking is wild. That tells you how much volume there is there. He is a busy striker. He will come forward. He's got some okay power. He's very mobile, tons of volume. While he is primarily a striker, he can work in takedowns as well. Three takedowns against Hunter Azure. He did two takedowns against Cuccinello back in 2018, and he had a couple of takedowns on the Ultimate Fighter as well. So he may come in here, work some takedowns against Garrett Armfield, but $8,800, he is a pretty sound favorite, and he is the Canadian, and people love pointing out that the last time all the Canadians won. I think that's a crazy narrative. He's taking on Garrett Armfield, one and one officially in the UFC. He stepped up on short notice against David Onama, and yes, he was submitted, but he just went right at David Onama, just went right at him, got his neck caught, was submitted. But that's what short notice gets you. Right? He just was like, well, let me shoot my shot and get this done. But overall, Garrett Armfield is a technical striker. He likes to double up his jab. He'll switch his stance back and forth. He's always working forward. He stays controlled. He doesn't take a lot of risk, but he will stay in your face and he will stay busy with those hands. He does a really good job kicking the legs and then he'll work his way to the top. He doesn't look for offensive takedowns. He just doesn't. But he does have some clean power in his shots when he once in a blue moon does shoot one. Garrett Arfield, pretty well-rounded guy. He absolutely blew through Tiyoshi Kazama where his striking looked very clean. He touched that guy up early and he put him out of there. Garrett Arfield is Jacob's underdog lock of the week. $7,400, I think, is a great price for Garrett Arfield. A great price. The reality is Brad Katana is not a finisher. So this fight is likely going to go a decision. And Garrett Arfield has the wrestling if he needs it. He never uses it, but he's got some technical striking. He has a little bit of power. Garrett Armfield, at the very least, will put up some okay numbers in a loss. I think Brad Katana wins this fight. I think he has proven many times over that he could win at this level. He did it two times in the Ultimate Fighter. He did it actually in the Octagon in the UFC. And Garrett Armfield is also a very good fighter. This is a great matchup as well. I think Brad Katana wins. With that being said, Garrett Armfield is the better fighter for your DraftKings lineup because he is only $7,400. That is a very good price for a guy that we know can stay tough, we know can stay in your face, and he will stay busy with the hands, fighting a guy that doesn't really finish. So I like Garrett Armfield at $7,400. You, you need underdogs. There's no way to build a six-person lineup with this budget without having underdogs in it. Then we have the main card opener. We have Arnold Allen taking on Movzvar Evlaev. Movzvar Evlaev puts up numbers. Movzvar Evlaev should be in your lineup. Very, very simple. The only time he didn't put up astonishing numbers is when he fought Grundy. Grundy is a very, very good wrestler. So Movzvar ended up in a striking match because he was fighting another high-level wrestler. And he still, I mean, Grundy's striking sucks. So to say that he outstruck him I'd be embellishing a little bit. He did outstrike him, but I would be sort of pushing a narrative that shouldn't be there. Essentially, Mozvar Evlaev is a non-stop, very good grappler. His control is just okay. You don't get nine takedowns in back-to-back -back fights with very good control time. You're going to see control nine minutes and 55, basically 10 minutes in a 15-minute fight and nine takedowns. What this is saying is he gets the takedown, his opponent stands up, but he's still latched onto the hips. He's still holding you against the cage. Takes you back down. You hang out for a little bit. You stand back up. He still latch on. He always has his hands wrapped around you. He is almost never fighting at distance. I think Mozvar Evlaev is worth $8,700. I think he wins this fight. I think he smothers Arnold Allen. Arnold Allen, very good striker. Very good striker. Got a little bit of power. Not an insane amount, but he does have a little bit of power in there. He has, if we go back to his UFC debut, there's a couple submissions in here as well. He can sneak something out. But I just think Arnold Allen's going to struggle with the heavy wrestling pressure of Mozvar Evlev. You're going to see the Qatar finish. Qatar got hurt. Dan Hooker finished. This was at like, Dan Hooker had that weird point in his career where like he sucked. And now he's like working his way back up. Proved that he's tough. But for a couple minutes there, Dan Hooker was terrible. And now he's on the upswing. 
This was when Dan Hooker was terrible. This was an injury. That wasn't a true win. This was an injury. The rest of these are decisions for a reason. Arnold Allen, good striker. Arnold Allen going to stay in your face. Good upright stance. His takedown defense is very good. It's 78%. No, sorry, 76%. He has defended 15 takedowns since 2018. The last time he was taken down was against Amir Khani. But Amir Khani did body him. I think Mosvar Evlaev will as well. And I think we're getting a great price on Mosvar here. He should be in your lineup. Then we have Chris Curtis and Marc-Andre Barot. Chris Curtis, $8,500. And you know what? The Chris Curtis that knocked out Buckley, worth the money. The Chris Curtis that knocked out Brendan Allen, worth the money. Knocked out Phil Halls, worth the money. The Chris Curtis that did not show up against Vieira and was sort of given a decision against a jiu-jitsu guy, not worth the money. The Chris Curtis that was outstruck by a jiu-jitsu guy, not worth the money. Kelvin Gaslam, that was a war. He did show us how tough he is. And then the Imovov fight, Chris Curtis was getting touched up, man. He was getting touched up in that fight. He got taken down. He was losing this fight. And then luckily there was the no decision for him that spared him a loss. I think Chris Curtis loses this fight. And even if he doesn't lose this fight, the only way he is worth this money is if he finds that left check hook knockout. That is the only way because he wasn't worth this money in the decision win over Vieira. Wasn't worth the money if he somehow won the Jack Hermanson decision. Give him 30 more points. 47 in a win. He's just not worth the money if he doesn't find the knockout. And that's because he's a counter striker. He's a low volume backup counter striker. He's very good at counter striking. His takedown defense is spectacular. He has some very real power in that counter striking. But if he doesn't find that chef check left hook knockout, he's not going to put up any numbers. He's taking on Marc Andre Barro. This guy's going to come forward, stay in your face, super busy, averaging about six significant strikes landed per minute, which is a high number. He stays busy. He comes forward. He wrestles sometimes. Not all the time. He wrestles sometimes. But he will stay in your face and he will work. And he will work the entire time. Marc-Andre Barot, unfortunately though, is not the more technical striker in this matchup. He can be knocked out. Chidi and Jaquani was able to get to him. I don't think he's going to get knocked out in this fight. So on its surface, you have Marc-Andre Barot, a come forward, busy offensive striker taking on a very good counter striker. In theory, you would say, well, Mark andre is playing immediately, directly into Chris Curtis's hands, directly into Chris Curtis. That's what Chris wants. Come at me so I can do what I need to do counter striking. But this is Canada. And I think Mark andre will not get knocked out with a check left hook. So now we have Chris Curtis backing up the exact same way he was against Jack Hermanson the exact same way he was against Rodolfo Vieira. And I don't think Chris Curtis wins that fight. He, I think he finds a knockout or he loses. I don't think he's going to knock out Marc-Andre. I do think Marc-Andre wins this fight. $7,700. That's where it gets a little tricky. He did beat Anders, but he knocked Anders down. If we take 10 points away, because that's what you get for a knockdown. If we take 10 points away, we're at 71 points. Not great. He finished Julian Marquez. He is not going to finish Chris Curtis. So we need to find the fights where he's winning decisions without a finish. Dolce Lungambula, only 80 points. And that's all we're going to get out of him. Only one decision, didn't score a ton of points. He doesn't score that well because it's striking only. Obviously, if he gets a finish, but he's not going to finish Chris Curtis. This fight will go to a decision unless Chris is the one getting the knockout. I do think Marc-Andre wins. I'm not going to have Chris Curtis in my lineup. $7,700 is a very tempting number, maybe some exposure, but even if he wins, I think he's putting up 80 points, something like that. I don't think he's going to put up 100. He's not going to finish Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis is too tough, too durable, and too good at this point in his career to get finished, but I do think Marc-Andre Burrell is going to win a decision here. Then we have Mike Malott, Neil Magny. Mike Malott, other side of that spectrum. He is a finisher. He will win by finish, most likely. $9,300. He has proven... Three up, three down. He has proven to be worth that money. Mike Malott's this new generation of fighter. Good at everything. Not amazing anywhere, but good at everything. We know he can come forward. We know he can strike. We know he can grapple. We know he can submit. Mike Malott should win this fight. Mike Malott is fighting the toughest guy he has ever fought. He has also never been to a decision. And this has Gabriel Bonfim written all over. Remember Gabriel Bonfim? The insanely dangerous, all finish young prospect. That went out there against Nicholas Dalby. Almost had Nicholas Dalby out. 
And when he didn't put him out, just completely folded in half and lost that and quit. And what a. The problem is when you don't see a fighter dig into that well, when you don't see a fighter in very real trouble and survive, when you don't see a fighter go the distance in a war, you don't know what they're actually made of. Very easy to be a hammer, very hard to be a nail. My big concern with Mike Malott is can he be a nail, at least for a little bit? Can he grind? We don't know. I don't think it's going to matter in this fight because while Neil Magny has all the veteran savvy in the world, he's not dangerous. He's not dangerous. I don't think he's going to have Mike Malott in any trouble. The only way Neil Magny wins this fight is a weird decision. The same way he beat Daniel Rodriguez, the same, and I mean, this should have been a decision. We were five seconds away from a decision. So it says sub, we're going to call it a decision. And the same way he beats Phil Rowe. Phil Rowe was beating Neil Magny and then just chose to make terrible decisions in that fight chose to clinch with neil magny and that's what neil wants to do neil wants to clinch with you slow you down hold you against the cage neil's sort of just a busy striker that can slow you down and tie you up that's what he is now if we look at the losses these are quality losses ian gary very good loss gilbert burns very good loss shavkat rachmanov very good loss michael chiesa good loss ponzinibbio good loss Rafael Dos Anjos, good loss. And let's look at the wins. He beat Hector Lombard. Hector Lombard, if you don't know who he is, he was the greatest Bellator champion of all time. Beat Johnny Hendricks, former welterweight champion of the world. Carlos Condit, former welterweight champion of the world. Robbie Lawler, former welterweight champion of the world. The reason I'm pointing all of this out is Neil Magny, easy for me and everybody else to say Mike Malat's going to blow through him. But Neil Magny is very accomplished, has fought some of the best fighters that have ever walked this earth, and has beaten a handful of them. I don't think he wins this fight. I think this fight looks exactly like the Michael Chiesa one. But, best fighter Mike Malott has ever fought. I'm going to have Mike Malott in my lineup. I do have a parlay with him on my actual bets, but only one. Because he is young, and Gabriel Bonfrim taught us all a lesson. Then we have the co-main, Raquel Pennington, Myra Buena Silva. $8,600 for Myra Buena Silva. She is worth that money most of the time, right? She didn't get to that with Holly Holm, but keep in mind that first round, she was just held against the cage the whole time. Did nothing, did nothing, lost that first round on every scorecard, held against the cage, did nothing. And then in the second round, found that submission. Holly let her left neck out there, but, but submitted. But outside of that, she's very, very dangerous. The Lena Landsberg fight was worth the money. The Stephanie Egger fight was worth the money. The Yonan Janan fight, not necessarily worth the money, but that is a very tough opponent who is fighting for a title. Fighting for a title. And so is Myra Buena Silva, I suppose. The problem with Myra Buena Silva, yes, she is very dangerous. I mean, look at all of these wins. Sub, 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 sub. She's very, very dangerous. The problem, though, is she just accepts backing up. We saw that in the first round, the Holly Holm fight. She just accepted, yeah, I'm going to be held against the cage. This round's gone. And that is exactly how Raquel Pennington fights. That is all Raquel Pennington does, is come forward, hold you against the cage for an infinite amount of time, maybe work in a takedown, an infinite amount of time. That's all she wants to do, is work in control time, hold you against the cage, be as boring, wet blanket as possible. And I think she can do that here. And I think she will have success doing that here because Myra Brena accepts those positions. And yes, she found a submission against Holly Holm. And she is insanely dangerous. And it's not ridiculous that Myra Brena Silva wins this fight. She has proven to be dangerous. She is who the UFC wants to win this fight. But Raquel Pennington, it's similar to the Neil Magny breakdown. She has fought some of the best women on the planet. Her losses are only to the best women on the planet. Holly Holm, former champion, former professional boxer. Jerrain Durandamy, former World Time Moy champion, the first ever women's bantamweight champion. Amanda Nunes, greatest of all time. Holly Holm again. Jessica Andraj, former champion. She has only lost to former champions. She has beaten every other person in between, including Misha Tate, who was a former champion. Pani Kanzad, busy. Marion Renault, not great. Aspen Ladd, honestly, that's a decent win. Ketlin Vieira, very good win. That was a close fight. I think Raquel Pennington wins this fight. I think she is boring. I think she comes forward, slows down the pace, slows down the action, and wins what should be a nap. But Raquel Pennington, I think, wins this fight. $7,600.
I, unfortunately, I do think that's okay. We have five rounds to work with. She scored 69 in three. Add two more rounds to that. All of a sudden, you're at 90. So I do think Raquel Pennington wins this fight. And then we have the main event of the evening. I'm going to tell you right now, pick your side. Pick your side. I'm going to give you my breakdown. Pick your side. It's basically even money for a reason. Sean Strickland somehow weaseled his way into a championship and won the belt. He dropped Izzy, had that dude down and out, and then just came forward and beat the brakes off of him for 20 more minutes. And these significant strike numbers are insane. That's who this guy is. He comes forward with volume, with pressure. A lot of people think he won that Jared Cannonier fight. But he comes forward with, and if he did, then all of a sudden it's 98 points instead of 68. He comes forward with pressure, with volume. He's got that good Philly shell boxing. Does not have a ton of power. Yes, he did. I mean, maybe he just discovered it this year or 2023 because he did finish a boost. He did almost finish Adesanya. But before that, I mean, he's not really knocking people down. You have Brendan Allen back in the day at 170. Whoever the hell Talib is. I mean, Tlaib went on to do great things after that. Anyway, Sean Strickland, busy striker. We know who he is. Very good takedown defense. He's got good grappling as well. He's the more accomplished grappler. I think he's a black belt. Like He's a very good grappler. He just never uses it. We never see it. Sean Strickland, very good striker. Going to come forward, stay busy, try to stay in your face. The problem is, if Sean Strickland can't come forward and dictate the pace, he's not a very good counter striker. He is all volume in your face. Drikas Duplessis does not back up. He comes forward. He marches as sloppy as he is. He is always working forward, always working in your face, trying to get the takedowns, throwing bombs, staying busy. He is a sloppy, sloppy fighter. He just is. And there's a lot of people in the comment section. Somebody said generational talent. Somebody said, like, a lot of people love this guy, and I get it. I get it. He's exciting to watch. He's fun. His personality is actually pretty solid too. He stays in your face. He stays busy. He's an exciting fighter to watch, but go watch that Darren Till fight and tell me he's not sloppy as hell. Go watch the Derek Brunson fight and tell me he's not sloppy as hell. But we also look at the win column and he makes it happen. He figures out ways to win. He is sloppy. He is a mess. He couldn't breathe in half these fights. Apparently now he's got the greatest cardio in the world because they drilled a hole in the other side of his nostril. I do think Drikas Duplessis somehow pulls off a win here. I think he's definitely the more dangerous of the two. I think he's going to come forward nonstop, say in Sean Strickland's face, and this might look like the Sean Strickland Izzy fight, except it's going to be reversed. Sean Strickland stayed in Izzy's face, caught him early, and just stayed in his face, and Izzy did not know what to do with that. This might be the same thing. When was the last time we saw somebody full pedal on the gas in Sean Strickland's face? That's who Drikas is. That's what this fight's going to look like. Sean did drop Izzy, did drop a boost, but outside of that, doesn't have an insane amount of power. If he had way more power, I'd be Sean all day because Drikas is hittable and sloppy. I do think Drikas is going to win this fight, but pick your side. Whoever wins this fight is going to put up very real numbers. I agree with this pricing. Sean should be a slight favorite. He is the champ. But this is a 50-50 fight. I'm excited for it. This is a great card. Guys, become a premium member. You will unlock the DraftKings Optimizer. You will unlock everything else we do for DraftKings, including the cheat sheet that will be fully loaded with the ownership projections, the scoring projections, the leverage plays. These tabs are write-ups of who should be your leverage play, who is a live dog, who should be your fade, who should be your GPP core. And then we rank every single fighter by salary. All of this and so much more for $10 a month at wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member at the top and join this community that will put up a half a million dollars in the next few months. It'll be in less than 12 months, we will have a half of a million dollars in winnings from this incredible community. Wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top.